Andrew, you acted in middle school, high school, college. Yeah. What made you want to come to LA and think that you could do it as a career? Uh, so I was born in LA, um, moved to San Diego when I was a kid, and my earliest memories of, of me wanting to act. Um, I, I just nev have never known anything different. It's just what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And fortunately, being born here um, and understanding the system of LA was, was a huge plus. So it's, it's just never has been something I questioned. It was just always been something I was going to do. And, and I didn't have to come to LA. I could just be here because I have always been here. So yeah, it's just always been something I was going to do, period. And I never thought anything different. Yeah. Uh, you said something really interesting about uh, the system of yeah. LA. What, um, what uh, is that system? LA is a system, has a system. You have to understand that LA is smaller than people think. It's spread out for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to get used to, to how things run here, um, how traffic works, how when you have a job, how to get there. And, and it, I mean, it's, those, it's the living details. Right. Uh, I think a lot of people come here that I talk to and I tell them, take a year to get used to things. Don't worry about making a, a move in the industry. Don't move about getting auditions. Don't worry about all this stuff. Understand how L.A. works, you know, understand that um, it's going to take an hour to get anywhere. Um, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, <laughs> understand that your social life is those you work with. And when you want your social life, you have to plan for that. It's not like New York where you can walk down the street and hit seven bars in 30 minutes. It's not like that. It, it's, it's different. And um, everyone here is a working professional and um, you have to prepare for that. And so understanding that system and growing up in it really was super helpful um, because then I could just get into the work and worry about that kind of stuff because, you know, living here is second nature, obviously, for me. So what made you want to act? I know you said it was just in you. I don't but know. You I never just, saw like a movie like no. E.T. or something. And you're like, no. I, I, I just remember being I born. I want to be Elliot. Being born and wanting to do it. I, I, my earliest memory is just wanting to do it. I do remember um, watching the movie Life with Mikey with Michael J. Fox. Okay. Uh, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, he, yeah he, was, he plays an agent in the film and he finds this girl on the street who's like hustling. And he's like, she's a great actor. Let's get her in commercials. That was the first time I understood that I needed an agent. Um, but I, ever since, I mean, I was born, I, I couldn't tell you what it was. I just was born. Just knew I wanted to do it. Did anybody try to talk you out of it? Never. Never? Never once. That's great. Parents, family, relatives, friends, all of them have been super supportive. Just like, yeah, this is what he's going to do. And that's that. And they've always supported me. That's Never awesome. heard anything negative. That's wonderful. Yeah. You said something really interesting about the friendships um, are the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's so fascinating is everybody has like these side jobs. And so sometimes it's hard to like get together with people, especially on the weekends, because that's when a lot of people are doing their side job, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so that was one thing that's really interesting because you don't coming from other places. Maybe there's more of a nine to five life. Yeah. Maybe not now. Maybe I'm thinking of other times, but no, I think so. I think so. Absolutely. Um, I just know that the way LA is built, it, it is so spread out that if you want to get anywhere, you have to plan for it. And it's just easier to make friends with those you work with. You know, they, you see them all the time and you, and this was a really hard lesson for me. You, you know, when I went to college, you, you're, you see your friends every day, you hang out all night, you party all night, whatever. Uh, and then you go to finals super exhausted and that's that. But then when you come here, it's like, oh, people are working, people are doing things and you, and you have to be prepared for that. And you're not going to be out till three in the morning every day. A, you're going to be going to bed and then getting up and going to work and then working on your career and working on your things and, and then meeting your friends once a week for dinner if you're lucky, you know, because everyone's busy. And I like that. It's a different phase of life for me. It's just, it's where I'm at now and it feels good. It feels like the right place. Where did you go to college? Just a small community college in Orange County called Saddleback. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Amazing school. Mm -hmm. Amazing I've heard great school. things. Yeah, I love it. And uh, did you take um, acting or you got an AA or what did you uh, do? So I, I studied, I majored in psychology and social behavior. I decided to quit acting forever. <laughs> uh, about six months in, I begrudgingly auditioned for one of the plays. 
that was it. I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this again for the rest of my life. Um, and dropped all my classes, took every theater course I could, every screenwriting course I could, and um, overloaded everything and then finished those classes. I didn't technically graduate um, because I just dropped all, dropped all my major stuff. I just went right into every acting class I could um, and got back into it. So I took like a six month hiatus, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and then, sorry, how long have you been in LA? Uh, like, I've been back for about three and a half years now. Oh, I see. Okay. Because yeah. you, you. So, were like, back. I was, I technically I grew up in San Diego um, and then moved to Orange County for school. Uh, went to Saddleback, studied there, and then right after I finished all the courses I could take, I moved right back up here um, and just went full board. Nice. Yeah. It's a really pretty campus, isn't it? If I'm thinking of the yeah, right. Yeah, it's small, but it's nice. It's pretty, mm -hmm. yeah. They're, they're really developing it. I like it a lot. It's just great education. I mean, all my professors were from Yale and Juilliard, and oh, so wow. I got all their insights for a very small price. <laughs> yeah, no, a lot of people are doing the whole two years at community college and then transferring. Right. Brilliant. Especially now. Oh. Yeah. I knew I, I knew I wasn't going to transfer. I knew I was just going to come up here and start beating the streets up and nice. really making films and acting and writing and doing everything I could to get in. So your first day back, what was that like after your, you know, you've come, you've got your 60 units or whatever it was at Saddleback and then you come here. What uh, was that like the first day? Super awesome. Um, it's, it's a funny story. I, I sat outside this Airbnb my friend and I were renting for two weeks because uh, we didn't have a place yet. And I sat in my car and I said, I, I'm gonna do this. If, if, even if I have to live in my car to do this, I will. I'll never let it get to that point, but if I had to, I would. And everything changed after that. You know, my roommate and I, we, we lived in this Airbnb for like two weeks. And then the lady had this like, this uh, shed that she had turned into like a photography studio, really small square shed, no running water. We lived in that for three months, no space. It was crazy. Oh and then we moved up to this, we subleased this apartment. Uh, we shared a room there and then we moved into our own place, then moved into a bigger place. So we've been steadily climbing ever since. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. That's cool that, I mean, she lets you, sounds like she was a creative, obviously, if she's doing yeah. photography. Oh yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She was an awesome, awesome landlord for sure. Super oh, cool. great person. But yeah, it was just a little tight, a little tight <laughs> living in that box. <laughs> Would you say you're a confident person or more realistic? Super confident. Super confident? <laughs> yeah. Um, I humbly confident. I, I try to re remain, um, my definition of realism is way different uh realistic to me is yeah go out and make a movie for no money that it happens just do it uh realism for me is yeah you have nothing move out to la and be a filmmaker be an actor be an artist whatever you want to do so my definition of realism is not society's definition i think and i'm very confident in that yeah i really believe in just doing it going for your dreams did you see that in someone did you see it in an artist that you admired or or you know, watch a documentary on something? No. Um, I just didn't know any other way. I, I, uh, maybe I saw it. My dad is, is realistic according to society standards. You know, you, you grow up and you, you go to school and you get a job and, and you go after your dreams and you, you know, pay for your bills and this type of that. Uh, my dad's super supportive of my dream. Um, but he, I think he learned how to accept my way of thinking, which is just like, um, yeah, things will get done. I'll get my rent paid. Don't worry about it. I'll get my, my bills paid. Don't worry about it. But I'm also going to make this movie and I'm just going to do it. Whether anybody helps or not, it's just going to get done, period. And um, I think going full board into something, you have to, you have to be sure of it, you know? And uh, it took a long time to develop confidence. Confidence, I think, is a learned habit. Um, all my, I mean, our 20s, anyone's 20s are just a hectic mess, I'm sure. Mine were. And, uh, you know, that's where I learned how to say yes and say no and be confident in decisions I was making. It took a long time to, to learn that habit. What's great, too, is now there's like these side gigs. And I know there's mm -hmm. talk on, well, it's actually not as lucrative as you think. And, and that's a whole other discussion. But when I moved here, there wasn't that. So that's what's nice about you can be a creative and then do these like side hustle jobs yeah. that they didn't really totally have right. back yeah. then. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's so many opportunities now 
I always say is money will come. There's so many opportunities to, to have an income. Um, and today there are so many different kinds of side hustles that allow a creative to spend more of his time doing what they want to do, creating, um, writing, working, acting, painting, dancing, whatever it is. Um, and then they go to their day job at night or in the day or whatever, and um, they come home and they work on their art. And I, I think it's a great time to be an artist, super great time, so many opportunities to, to be an artist, for sure. And maybe it's just because I live in LA and I was raised here, so that's all I see. <laughs> but yeah, I, I see it everywhere. It's just everyone's an artist, everyone's doing something, and they're still paying their bills. Now that you've been back in LA, what, three years, how has your perspective on acting and, and being here changed, or is it all still the same? Oh, it's changed for sure because as humans, we change and evolve and grow. Um, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's way less fear than I used to have. There's way, uh, I used to have expectations that LA was imp something impossible to break into, um, that the industry was this, this untouchable dream. Um, but with all the streaming services that are available, with all the um, online platforms that are available, there's been so much more opportunity for work for, for any creative. Um, I mean, films are being made every day. Pilot season is all year, you know, because, because these streaming services are just buying so much work and buying so many creatives to, to work on these things. And it, it, there's no seasons anymore. I mean, there are, there are, but it's just different because when you, when you release on Netflix or, or Hulu or Amazon Prime, it, it can be year round. So that has been super helpful because that took all the fear away. There's always something being made. And there's, for the independent artist, there's always something you can make and always an opportunity for it to be seen because of all these platforms. So that's a huge difference. And that really made me more confident in the whole LA system. And two, when you meet people that have booked something or you see they have a national commercial, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, wow, like that's someone I know. And yeah, yeah, they're doing it, you know, then it makes it seem possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. A, a friend of mine, he I mean, I see him on commercials all the time and it's it's just do it's just now more doable than ever. Um, a lot of my friends direct commercials or direct music videos and and they tell me how they got started and whatnot. And it's just, like I said, way more doable than it's ever been. And it's super, super, uh, a super warm feeling to know that. In the last few years, I, I believe, and please stop me if I'm wrong, uh, you've begun to write and direct and produce your own projects. Do you wish you had done that earlier or would, did you come into it in the right time? Feel like it's naturally evolved yeah i think it naturally evolved i think it came in at the right time for sure um in my early 20s it just there's no way you know as a, as a young kid like that you're just trying to figure so many things out and you don't know yourself and you're trying to know yourself and um having the foundation of wanting to be an actor was always there but today's triple threat it's very different than it was in the 50s where you know you had to be able to sing dance and act you know it's very different today being a triple threat is being able to write your own stuff produce your own stuff direct your own stuff star in your own stuff um, and then distribute your own stuff uh, and that if, if you can do all of that efficiently and proficiently um, you're going to get seen that's that's the new triple threat so coming into directing and writing um, and bringing that into my my wheelhouse as, um, it came at the right time for me now, because I think it's, it's necessary to be able to do all those things now as an artist, for sure. Yeah, and you talked about sort of like the crazy 20s, and I think some people are able to just kind of like know what they want, and, and others, there's other things they're working on, and without going too much down this path, also too, there's a lot of people preying on you when you're in your 20s. Mm. And it, and I, I've talked about this before, but if you don't, if you're not used to getting compliments or right. if compliments make you feel like a million dollars, which they do <laughs> with everybody, you're gonna find that element coming out when you walk down the street, yeah. when you go to a coffee shop and people seem legitimate. And I think it's being able to sniff out who's yes. 
a predator or yes. who's wasting your time. They may not yes. even be a predator. Right. And that takes some time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of uh, learning how to read people and learning how to um, uh, shuffle through all the BS and, and know who is just giving you a business card and know, knowing who can potentially advance your career. I found in my experience, when I meet people who um, can potentially aid my career in a way, um, it's best to just have a good conversation. Don't worry about pitching yourself. Don't worry about pitching your projects. Just get to know them as a person. Chat, talk, tell stories, anecdotes, get to know them, ask questions about them because people love talking about themselves. And then 90% of the time I found that they've wanted to get my information and find out what I'm doing afterwards. Um, and then you have those people who have no problem telling you everything about themselves without even being asked. And they always have this way of talking themselves up just a bit bigger than they are. And, and you, can, you can tell, you can read them, you know, mm, well, okay. And then you just move on from those people. Um, but because there's, like I said earlier, there's so much work being created today, uh, you just have to know who's, who's going to finish the work and who's just gonna start the work. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And then, and then also too, if, if you take it down the sort of predatory mm -hmm. route, there mm -hmm. are people that are so skilled at reading people and they know, <laughs> they know what's gonna get you. And if you're young and impressionable. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It, it, so, so, and if you don't have a Jiminy Cricket sitting on your yeah. shoulder saying, no, this person's no good for you, that's very difficult. And I think we're seeing, unfortunately, for men and women, it, it, it happens across the board, I think, equally, that people, I mean, and, and it's, it's human nature, I think, to fall prey to that because mm -hmm. we do want to know that we're special. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and some of those people are really good at knowing uh -huh. where to zero in. And so. I, th I think it takes a lot of time. To, yeah, you, you have to be careful when you're young and inf informable because it takes a long time to learn confidence. Like I said earlier, it takes some time. And when you can get to that point where a compliment is simply an addition to your happiness, it's not the source of your happiness. And, and you have to be able to have everything in Hollywood be additions to your life. You have to own your resolve. You have to be able to say, I'm good with or without it. And then when you get a compliment, you say thanks and, and you take it as truth and, and you're grateful for it. But that confidence will, will steer those kinds of people away who just want to take advantage or prey on you uh, because they know that they're not going to get anything from you because you, they won't be the source of your happiness, right? And, and you're not afraid of losing an opportunity, if you will. Right? I think that's another issue that young, young stars or young hopeful stars have is they're so afraid of losing an opportunity. They're so afraid of losing this potential thing, whether it's an, an agent or, or a manager or a job. You know, when, when it's the agent, the manager, they're just a joke and they're not going to do anything for you. But they're so afraid that it could be the one that they take it. When you can, when you can confidently say, you know what? No, something else will come down the line. That's when you're set. That's, that's the best place you can be as a beginning actor, as a long time actor or artist, um, being able to say no to things because you know in your heart that it's not the best place and you're not afraid of losing an opportunity because when you say no to certain things, that leaves room for the good things to come in, you know? I like that, that's really good. I like the fact that you said, I'm good with or without this. Yes. That's, that takes yes. a lot yeah. to get being, to that point. Being happy and not happy because Happy and I have an agent. Happy and I have a movie. Happy and I have a relationship. Not happy because I have an agent or a movie or a relationship, you know? Right. That's super important to have that gusto here in LA. Super important. I'm gonna take your advice. Good. I, I <laughs> needed to hear that today, so thank you. You're yeah. welcome. When the student is ready. Yes, yes. <laughs> Andrew will appear. That was really good. because. You're right, because we, especially everything's so external here. Mm -hmm. And so we all kind of, oh, I like that car. Oh, ooh, I want to do that, you know, and, and so everything's out there. And so yeah. it's not an easy thing to have it be about inside. Inside, for sure. sure. It takes a long time to get to that point, to where you're not afraid of saying no to things that could be something, you know, and just patiently waiting and working hard to, to make all the right opportunities happen. Because the opportunities will come when you have everything lined up and you're doing everything you can first, the right things will come.
you have a project that you just finished shooting mm -hmm. and that you wrote, starred in, mm -hmm. directed, mm -hmm. produced. Yeah. <laughs> and this was before that you had a short. Is that I right? I had a few shorts. You had a few shorts. Yeah, okay. A few shorts. So this is a feature. Yeah. Um, when did you begin writing it? It's called Come Into Your Own? Yeah, Come Into Your Own. Come Into Your Own. Um, I wrote the initial treatment, just a 12 page treatment, uh, maybe 2013. Um, I had an idea, went home that night, wrote it, the treatment in one night, and then sat on it, uh, finished school. Uh, once that was done, moved to LA. And when I was comfortable again here, uh, that's when I started writing the project. Yeah. Oh, so this is from the Saddleback years. It's from the Saddleback years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So, so it sounds like it's a personal, it's very personal. No. In some way? Or no, it's not. Okay. No, it's just an idea I had. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, What's the story? So the story follows a young gay man who is stuck in the rut of monotony. He's tired of his current relationship. So he decides to like stir the embers in his life and try something drastic just to feel something. And that leads to certain consequences. And uh, he has to learn through those things. Ooh. Yeah. We can't say what they are, right? It'll give away the... Um, he, he, makes some cho he makes choices, which is most important for that character. The character makes choices. And the choices lead to, lead to events that are good and bad, obviously. Hmm. It's life. Sure. Um, but he makes, I think, as any young 20 year old, learning how to make choices is important. That's where this character is in his life. He's learning how to make decisions, learning how to make choices. And I know that when humans, I for sure, um, are stuck in a rut, sometimes we do drastic things. You know, I'm just going to quit my job today. So I do it. Or I'm just going to break up with you today. So I do it. And then I go do something crazy just to feel something totally opposite of that. And that's what this character goes through. He is so burnt out on the, the monotony that he's lived his whole life. He just does something crazy, something different. And um, he goes full board into it, but it hurts some people along the way. And he has, to, he has to learn that he can take time to make decisions, you know? Is his life too safe? His life is way too safe. He, he makes, he's been taught how to live safe. He says that in the film. I was never taught how to do anything different or dangerous. And um, he, he wants to just explore, try things, you know, be scared. He's never been scared, wow. you know, he's just been bored and he's scared of being bored, you know, so he does some crazy things. Interesting. Yeah. It, what's the, the character has an interesting name. Yeah. The character is named Liram Alerio. Okay. So Liram, um, I believe it's been so long since I discovered these names. I think Liram is has something to do with being a free a free man a free person and then alerio i believe is is a, a version of a latin version of the word eagle you know he he i i've been taught i don't know if it's totally accurate but i've been taught that eagles are like the only kind of bird who will fly in the midst of a thunderstorm um and he he takes that that analogy to heart he wants to be something that will just try something dangerous like that and so i always like characters that have to grow into their names and he has to do that himself. So yeah, Lyra Malario, a free man who wants to fly on the wings of eagles. It's kind of what his name means. In a thunderstorm. In a thunderstorm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why did you write it? I didn't realize until recently why I wrote it. Um, on the surface level, I, I want to be a, a maker of my destiny. I don't want to wait, for, I don't wait for anything. I just do things and um, I wanted work. So I made work. I wrote a film to have a film done, feature. Um, I wanted to be out there. I wanted to have a calling card. Uh, but uh, internally, uh, I didn't realize, like I said till recently, that um, the theme of coming into your own, which is the title, come into your own, uh, is something everyone has to go through. I went through it in my 20s. Um, we have to make decisions. We have to learn how to act. We have to learn how to grow and communicate and gain confidence. and. Um, I realized at the time the initial idea came to me, that's exactly where I was. I was quitting one thing and trying something new and then going back to the, the thing I quit and quitting the thing I was trying something new and, and trying to figure out my place in, in this whole crazy thing called life. And um, subconsciously I had an idea of a young 20 year old doing that and, and wrapping that story up, or they're, I'm sorry, wrapping that theme of coming into your own, coming of age, in, in a story about a young gay man 
who decides to break up with his boyfriend in the middle of the proposal and then try dating a young girl for the first time in oh. his life uh -huh. um, and doing something drastic, something he's never done. Um, and like I said, though, that leads to consequences. You know, it, it teaches him, one, how to be honest with himself, be honest with others, be honest with everyone around him and, and figure out how to, how to guide his own life and not, be, not live off the guidance his parents have taught him to do, you know? So that's where I think subconsciously it came from. But actually producing the thing was just because as, as a filmmaker, you, we need to be producing work all the time. We need to be. It's just in our blood, you know? You think too, I mean, this is nothing against Orange County, but that it was so safe there. It's, it's very safe and sanitized. Safe, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful place. Um, um, but, but do you think because you were around that too, I mean, I'm just no, putting words in your mouth. No, no. Okay. Uh, I, I had come from a very dangerous, very dangerous living um, when the idea came to me. I was living out of state. Um, I, I was uh, in a very, very bad relationship. My mom had to literally buy a plane ticket and drag me home. It was bad. And that's why I decided I'm done with this life. I'm going to do something totally different. Oh. Um, and then I went back to what is truly comfortable, which is my art, my career, my craft, and went back to what is happy and safe for me, which is my career. Um, and I think that's partly why it stemmed, you know, he, he, does, <laughs> he does something dangerous. He does something different for himself, something that is out of character for him. And uh, he ends up realizing that and kind of going back to what he always knew. Okay, so it was the opposite. Yeah, it was, it was the a, very oh, opposite. It was very opposite. Wow, yeah. interesting. It was a very scary time. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, that, that's fine. And, <laughs> I have no problem talking about it, but yeah, it was crazy. It's up to you. I mean, I, I think some some people have had that and others, I don't want to say they've been sheltered, but that's basically the, the word. Right. And, and I think that This they, character totally was. Okay, he was sheltered. Yeah, I, I grew up with a lot of people like that. I wasn't, but I saw kids that they could only watch PBS. They yeah, could be home by a yeah, certain time. Same with him. <laughs> What's interesting about the story is it, 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 the story follows a young gay man um, in, in a world where that is just very much open and accepted all over the place. I mean, obviously being in LA, you know, we're fighting for that kind of equality and whatnot. Um, but in this, in this story, it's just, yeah, he's gay, who cares? He's just what he is. He's always been that way. His parents have always known. It's what it is, no big deal. Um, and which I think is a good place to be. Just be you, right? That's what he is. But his, his qualms are with how he was raised. It's, 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 you know, he says in the script, you know, I, I've, I've been from my front door to my backyard. You know, he's never seen outside his neighborhood. He was born and raised in LA. He went to school and had a career and developed a career he was supposed to develop. And, and he, he dated the guy he was supposed to date. You know, he found the success his parents wanted him to find. And that, that's what drove him to say, I'm, I need to do something crazy. And he decides to do that. <laughs> and um, it, it, it shocks him. You know, it shocks his system, which is what he wants, but not in the best way possible, right? He hurts people along the way doing so. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, living. I think I feel like in your twenties you can you can be that wild person, and mm -hmm. then especially if you have other responsibilities, even mm -hmm. if you don't have kids, it's just harder. Yeah. But you know, some people don't come into their own until way later sixties. There's a character in the yeah. film, who, his mentor, the mentor character, who comes into his own late into his forties. Okay. You know, they both kind of help each other realize that the character's name is Ted, and he works with Liram. He's this man child he, he works at this they, they work at this small startup um a, a health beverage company oh, nice. and and this young this 45 year old guy is working with all these young 20 year olds and trying to be cool and trying to <laughs> right. be their friend oh. and trying to be hip with their lingo and trying to be a millennial and he's just so not <laughs> and he realizes that through helping this young kid figure himself he figured oh you know i i'm an adult and i i can be this father figure and i can just love myself as I am, just a, just a gentle man who works with this group of young kids, but I don't have to try and be this young guy. I can just be who I am. So yeah, it's true. I and mean, then every character I hope is trying to come into their own with this film, no matter what age, no matter what age. 
And that's, <laughs> I hope, how we all are in life. I, I fortunately was able to figure all that mess out in my 20s, and now I feel better than ever. But yeah, there are definitely people who <laughs> are learning late into their late into their 50s, you know? Right. That's totally fine. Or beyond. It's beyond. Yeah. Totally fine. It's totally fine. Right. As long as you're progressing, as long as you are coming into your own. Does it talk about sort of like either family or cultural pressures or, or whatever? Ooh, um, or no? No. What's interesting is, is his character is Hispanic and he comes from a very Latin-based family. His, his dad, uh, very much of an, an American white man. His mom, Hispanic. Now, they're just mentioned in the film. His mom is very Latin. He says she wears big jewelry and is very colorful in the life of the party because that's how my, my Latin family is. You know, they're very colorful. <laughs> and, um, but for the subtext of the character, his, his mom came and decided to live the American dream, you know, with her husband and, you know, taught her son to grow up and go to college and get the nine to five and date the right person and be married by, you know, 26 or 27 and have kids when you're 32 and this and this and this and this and follow the order. Um, and that's what he was taught by his parents. And so it was, it was cultural influences according to the American dream, mm -hmm. you know, is what, is what his parents wanted him to live as a Hispanic man. You know, right. he, he tells this young, so, so the, the girl he dates in this film is, is a white girl who was raised all over the world, speaks multiple languages, um, grew up in, 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 was born in Concepcion, Chile, went to Tokyo, studied there and all over the world because her, her father was in politics and just traveled. He was a diplomat. And she, he sees this white, this, this white American woman who is culturally aware and speaks languages and is so not what the surface looks like. And he, being a Latin man, is so not that. He's just a white American and, and, and he wants to be in touch with his culture. He wants to be in touch with um, his, his Hispanic roots. He speaks Spanish because he was taught that as his first language, but it, it's just words for him. It's, it doesn't mean anything. You know, there's no romance in the beauty of the language for him like there is for her, you know. And so there's that there's that interesting dynamic between the two where you see this white young girl who is culturally, culturally relevant and then this Hispanic boy who is not, you know. And I wanted to touch on that for those reasons. It's always interesting when we see someone and it's not even where there's like a physical attraction. It's mm -hmm. just you're like, I want to be like, yes. you can be male or female. Yeah. Oh, that makes me want to cry when you say that. Because that is exactly what this film is about. This film is not about him figuring out his sexuality. He's a gay man, he knows it, but he's in love with what she represents. He, he dates her because he wants to steal culture from her. That's his, that's his whole thing. He loves everything she is. He may not be physically attracted to her, but he loves her history and the languages she speaks and all the earth she's touched in his life, you know? You know, she's touched the ground where he's only dreamed of. He res he's, a, he's a research developer for this health beverage company, and he researches the world behind a computer screen. And he's just envious of that. And so that's why he dates her, is because he's in love with the idea of those things. It's so amazing that you say that, because it's exactly what happens to him. Right. Well, they say sometimes that's why we fall for certain people, is because we actually almost want to be them, because they're like living what we so want. To, true. You know, we want to not not even what they're doing, but like who they are. Whether they're just they're not bound by certain. Oh my gosh! You know, <laughs> it makes me so emotional when you say that because it's like <laughs> that's so exactly what the character is. That's amazing. That's amazing that you say that. Well, also too, it can be. I mean, we're getting really deep here, but mm -hmm. why somebody could be jealous of someone too? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It, it might not, and it could be again, male or female. Mm -hmm. it Doesn't could matter. Be the, you, the opposite gender, but you could just see something in them, and you won't allow that in yourself. And so, instead of like you just like I hate that person. Oh my gosh. And and <laughs> you know because in my have you ever I've I felt that when yeah. I was younger I would see certain people and then I started to realize like. They had troubles too, and uh -huh. they weren't perfect. But some people, I don't know if they, it's so easy to like, you could do that with celebrities. So, so true, so true. In fact, her character is so different from him. She 
sees in his life this rooted man, this guy who grew up with a stable family, a mom and a dad and a sister, the white picket fence, everything. Went to the same school his whole life, had a best friend, pets, those kind of, everything that he has, she wants. But they can't give each other that. And that's what creates the conflict, right? Um, but it, it's so true. They, they both feel that way. Oh, I'm so jealous of you. You've had this great family relationship. Her parents are split up. Um, yours didn't that happens today parents stay together what and she wants that so bad she wants to have you know she wants to live in one home for the rest of her life and he's like no i want to live on a boat and travel the world so it's it's amazing that you pick that out in, in, in humans because that's so what these characters are amazing yeah i think that people as like you know because if you didn't have let's say the white picket fence mm -hmm. and you do see someone that has it like this like stable thing you're like oh wow i wish i could have that right. and they look at you as maybe like oh wow you don't have all the pressures i yeah. have and i, I mean don't the have grass to is always greener they right say. right right wow that's amazing did you read any screenwriting books while you were writing these? yeah um dialogue by robert mckee story by robert mckee um save the cat uh pretty much all of them <laughs> all the all the famous ones um because i needed to learn you know, more better formatting, um, stuff like that. Um, watched a lot of uh, watched a lot of videos, um, learning uh, how to pr appropriately write character arcs and development story arc and, and those kinds of things. So yeah, studied a lot of a lot of different things. And did you already write the screenplay before you started reading the books, or uh, I had started because when I went to school, I had I had taken screenwriting classes, so I knew how to do it, but. Um, the, 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 the books obviously very much helped tighten everything up, you know, um, helped solidify what I had already known and um, give me confidence that, okay, I, I'm on the right path as far as structure is concerned, um, how I'm on the right path as far as how this character should evolve and develop. Um, I truly believe in formula and I think these books offer really solid formula that you can just color by number. You know, I have an idea, I have a story, this character needs to be this at this point. Uh, so let's get to that point. And uh, so they've super helpful to tighten everything up. So you outlined, obviously, because you said you, you came to treatment. Treatment, okay. Yeah, I, um, I'm, a free, I, I'm a free writer, honestly. I get my, do my best work when I just write. Um, I, I don't, I don't once, once the story's out, then I take time to really flesh characters out, um, which I guess is outlining. Um, but I wrote the treatment in, in a night. I, I, didn't, I didn't think about anything. I didn't let my, my rule, I didn't let rules get in the way. Just, just wrote it. And then is when I went back and said, okay, this character gets to that point because of this. So I guess I outlined a little bit later, but not initially. And where did you write it? Where were you when you were writing? I wrote the, the treatment I wrote in Orange County. This was when I was in school. Um, at and, your apartment? At my apartment, yeah, my, my house. And then uh, when I came to LA, I, I wrote the script in my room. Yeah, I, I set up my computer to my big TV and just wrote to the TV. <laughs> yeah, just wrote oh, it. Oh, nice, so yeah. like huge font. Huge, huge font, huge nice. screen, just wrote it on the TV. Yeah, it was awesome. It's good on the eyes, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's way better. And then how long did it take you to finish total, would you say? I wrote the, uh, the first draft in two and a half months sat on it for six months, so I get a fresh look, and then went and did uh, the rewrite in about three weeks. And so about three and a half, three, three and a half months to write the whole thing. Um, paid for um, writers to, what, what's it called? Script coverage? Script, yeah, paid for coverage, oh. got coverage, got notes. I learned, probably the biggest lesson I learned is that everyone has an opinion and everyone will tell you their version of the story. <laughs> so as long as you trust your gut, it's great to get notes. It's great to get notes, but trust your gut first because you're going to get a thousand different notes and people are going to tell you, oh, why don't you try this? Or why don't you try that? Or try this, try that. And um, I think, honestly, I used maybe four or five of the notes that I got from everyone who did coverage because it was just so vast, you know? That was really, that was a really hard experience for me was knowing what to take. That's a great note. That's not a great note. That's okay. That's, that was where the work came in. That was where the work came in, was fixing according to what 
they were offering and knowing that, you know what, I don't have to use that note or that one's really good, I will use it. And being okay with that, you know? But that was really, I think, where the most work came in was <laughs> that. I, I would love to hear how you found the script consultants without giving yeah. their names. No, 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 um, no. Um, So I went to the blacklist. I submitted there. They responded with a lot of different notes. Um, I went to, uh, I applied for the Nichols Fellowship. Uh, they gave me a ton of notes back. Um, I went to writers' workshops locally in LA. I mean, you can just research a bunch. Um, and I met other writers there who had, who had credits under their belt, said, hey, can, can you do some coverage for me? They were always willing to, you know, paid them a little bit of money and they were always grateful to, to just give me notes. And um, that's where I found most of my coverage was from the writing workshops, is when networking with people in person and doing it that way. Um, and there's millions you can research online, millions. <laughs> Do you mind me asking how much you paid them? Just what's fair? I mean, yeah, no, I, I, because obviously, you know, the, I mean, they weren't professional. Like a lot of them were professional, but a lot of them weren't professional coverage. Um, I just know that they had credits under their belt, and so I would just offer, you know, I would say, hey, hundred bucks, does that work for you? And they're like, yeah, sure. And you know, a couple weeks or three weeks later, I, I would get some notes back, and they were always really fast turnarounds. I was surprised, you know, they always dedicated some time to it, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, I just offered what I could, you know, and that's what another thing is, is ask. Ask first. People are always willing to help. I got this film done because I just asked first, you know, and then saying, hey, what, what, can, what can we do? What kind of thing can we work? Everyone in LA negotiates. Just get comfortable with that language, the <laughs> negotiation language. And yeah, just offer them what you can and see what they can do and be, be, just, be, just be grateful for what, whatever you can get, you know, just be grateful. And uh, that's, that's pretty much what I found. How many uh, coverage reports oh, did you get back? <laughs> I don't know, like six to eight, maybe solid ones. And then, oh, wow. and then the rest were just f from friends and, and people who I knew growing up, who I knew were in the industry, um, but really like six to eight solid ones that were like, okay, you're, you're a solid professional. Um, who, who I can like trust, you know, because, you know, you have your friends read it. They're going to either tell you it's great or they're going to say <laughs> eh, it's awful. Rework it. You know, they're not going to give you specifics, but mm -hmm. the, I, I say coverage is great because they can give you specifics, you know. So you had six to eight people that you met. Yeah. That, that I met at these workshops wow. and stuff who were great, at, great at doing it. Yeah. yeah. And so that's where um, each time they gave you notes back, did you I, like how, how did that work when you got their notes? I'm sure you probably looked at it, <laughs> whether you considered it and actually yeah, did it is yeah. another thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, the, the, the pattern I found is that everyone, like I said, would typically give you, give you narrative notes. And, and I, I was looking for more structural notes, um, things like does, does character A get to point Z by this time? You know, and does the dialogue make sense? And, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily looking for someone to, to change the narrative as far as like this guy meets this girl and decides to do this with her. Um, but I got a lot of that. I got a lot of people like, well, why don't you, why does it have to be this? Why don't you try this? And those were the kind of notes that I was like, valid, but that's not where the story is going. This is the narrative. This is the path it's on. Does, does point A get to point B? Does point B get to point C? You know, and uh, that's kind of the, the, the formula I found. That's kind of the routine I found, yeah. So I would read the notes and then um, uh, pick and choose. And that was the best part. You get into pick and choose what worked and what didn't, you know? And you don't have to feel bad that they, they understand. They understand if you don't pick their note, that's fine. Well, they got paid. They too, got paid, so yeah. yeah, it's whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you get know? over it, yeah. 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 <laughs> Any advice to people on hiring a, a script consultant? What if they've never done it mm -hmm. and there's someone where they can hire them at a reasonable price? Yeah, it's not yeah. like this, you know, Yeah, for sure. Amount. Um, I, definitely the blacklist. I mean, it's, they're super well known and they, mm -hmm. their professionals are so good. So good. Um, they, they, they get back to you fairly quickly. Um, and they always offer great advice. Uh, they don't just say this is wrong, but they say this is what you could also do to fix that. Um, they, they, it's not just, I mean, it's comp they give you great compliments too, 
Um, they score you. Uh, so I would say look at the blacklist first because it's a really good introduction okay. to script coverage for sure. And then once you're working with a script consultant, anything, any do's and don'ts, any red flags, any anything that you really want to encourage more of? Um, be open for collaboration. Uh, as writers, uh, we're always very precious of our work, you know, um, but be open. Know that you are going to fix things and be excited to cut, be excited to fix. Um, it, it's really hard, it's so much easier said than done to like cut something. But I remember when I made my first cut, suddenly like the doors opened and I was like cutting everything. I was like, oh, let's cut that and let's cut that and let's cut that and let's cut that and let's, that and let's just make it, streamline it, you know? And then it got fun, you know? But it, it took a little, it took a little movement with someone else saying, hey, but this is why it could work, you know? And just be open, just be open for the, the consultant to give you the right, again, you don't have to take their advice, but just be open for it. And if you're not open for it, just pretend you are <laughs> because they're doing you a service, you know? So then basically don't hire a consultant just so they can tell you it's great. Be open to cutting. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, we will fluff our own egos enough. So don't just hire a consultant just to hear you're great because they will tell you you're not. They will tell you things to fix. Be open for that. Again, you don't have to take the notes. Um, they may be way off base because it's just an opinion from another, another writer or working professional, uh, but they do have valid points and just take those. Just say thank you and, and see how it could work. Um, try and play with it in your head. Give it, a, give it a chance. You know, okay, well, how could this work? Let's see if we do point A to point D and if we get it to that way, sure, let's try that. Um, and if it doesn't sit right in your gut, um, you'll know. But Again, don't listen to your gut because of your ego, though. You know, I, it just has to be this way because this is the way I wrote it originally. You know, trust, trust your gut as you step aside and say, this will be the best for the story. This will be the best for the characters. And again, it is your story. You know it better than anyone. Um, but they're just trying to help you get it to the best point it can be. So just, just be open for it. Just be open for it. Any red flags? Like what if you're not meshing? Mm -hmm. You don't have to mesh. Oh, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're not meshing with a person, that's fine. You don't have to. Uh, you're there for business. You're there for work. As far as red flags, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I've never, I don't know. I don't Sounds know. like you had all positive experiences. I had pretty positive yeah. experiences. I mean, if they were a weird per I didn't I didn't go to the weird people. <laughs> I didn't go, to, you know, I didn't go to the predators or whatever. I just I, I just noticed that they were all just wanting to help, wanting to give great advice or opinions. That's really what it was for me. That's great. And so after six or seven or eight, you were whatever like, I think was. I'm good. Yeah, whatever it was. I, I don't need to. It got, yeah, it got to the point where I was getting so many varied opinions that were so different from each other because this person would say, fix this. And that person would say, no, keep that, fix this. So it was very, very different. I got to the point where I was like, okay, I've got enough I can choose from if I want to. And then honestly, what ended up happening was I picked a couple here and there and, um, then very bluntly to myself said, what do you need to fix? Rip your emotions out, step on your heart, be a businessman now. You've already done the art part, be a businessman. What needs to be fixed? And then I had to read it, you know, I gave myself months before I reread it. I reread re 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 it and said, okay, there's not enough of this. So we gotta put that in, or this is leaning way too much over here, let's cut that. And then I just started cutting it and, um, and, and adding in the very little bits that I got from all the notes. Like that, I did like that. And I would just put them in here and there if I needed to. But I got to the point where it was the most important point I think any artist can get to is self-evaluation. You know, and just saying, you know what? This needs to go or this needs to stay or I need to adjust that. And being able to just step away from it emotionally and logically say, I need to fix this because that's the best piece of advice I can give is learn to step away from your ego and learn to learn to cut when you have to you know I don't like be precious that. about your work i like that i think that's easy for everybody to do i don't know it was it, it sounds very hard 
it's easier said than done, I think. Um, it, it, it got to the point, it was like, it's like breaking up, honestly. It, you, it's really hard at first, but suddenly you see a whole new world. You know, it's like, oh, I didn't die from this. I'm okay. I, and then it just got exciting. Then I just got, I developed, and then I developed the habit of cutting. I developed the habit of self-editing. Right. So I think you, you get more seasoned with your writing and you get more proficient and then you get to the point where it's like, no, it's just part of the job, you know? And so then you start now I'm, I look forward to it. And then in the editing room, I was like, hey, what else can we cut? What else can we cut? What else can we cut? You know, my editor was like, well, if you keep cutting, you're not going to have a movie. <laughs> um, I was like, he's like, he's he so no. good at this. He goes, trust me, you, know, you get to point, you get from point A to point B as fast as you could. They say, you know, enter a scene as fast as possible, get out of it as fast as possible. And he goes, you're doing that fine you're good don't worry about cutting any more than you you need to so that was the next piece of advice i had to learn was don't overcut just because it got easy to cut you know um, or don't over self-edit because it's it got easy to so learn how to self-edit and then know when to edit you know was there a certain structure you used or guidelines that you followed yeah the the basics the basic story arc structure you know First, uh, first introduction of the world by page 10, 11, there's an inciting incident um, that kind of offers the character a, a new look at life. Uh, it, in my film, it's a MacGuffin, it's a physical object, it's a cell phone. Um, by page 25-ish, you know, he's made the choice to enter into this new journey, this new world. And by the midpoint of the film, a big something happens and, you know, he gets to a point where he is at the point of no return where he's going to make this decision to go into this new way of life or not. And, you know, it, when you, when a character does that, it's, they're either a, a hero or they're either like the, the hero's journey or the tragic hero's journey. And, um, at that point of no return. And then by, you know, the last 15 minutes, fat 15 pages of the film, you're entering back into the new, the, the old world forever changed. I mean, it's classic formula. It's classic storytelling arc, you know, three, three act structure, um, with uh, a midpoint and the, the beat breakups in between each act. Yeah, it's classic and it works. So do it. <laughs> so you really, you down to the page. 100% okay. to the page. Okay. It makes everything easy. It's color by number at that point. It's you got 90 pages, 90 minutes. First 10 pages, establish the world. You know, establish your character, who your character is by action. What is he doing that tells the audience who they, or he or she, what, is, what are they doing that tells the audience who they are? That'll then let the audience know who they have to become, right? And then, and then, okay, for the next 10 pages, I have to kind of rustle some things up so that this character learns something. All right, now we're into act two. Okay, well, act two, I'm gonna throw some curveballs at him. All right, and we get to the midpoint. All right, let's, let's have something big happen, right? And then you go from there and, and it's, you just plugging ideas into these spaces and it makes writing so much easier for me. Now there's a lot of debate, yeah. Whether a lot of debate. So it sounds like it worked for you, worked and that's for me, great. And it'll forever work for me that way. <laughs> cool. That's good to know. What did you love about the story that kept you writing, or were there days where you're like, you know what, I'm bored with this. I need to change this around. Um, it was it was just the progression of the story. It was, honestly, it was the progression of finishing something, finishing a feature. Um, that was super motivating. Um, as far as the story, I, I, had, I knew where the character was going to end up. So I just knew I had to get there. Um, and it was just, uh, I, in my treatment, I had it broken up beat by beat in 12 pages, right? So basically page one of the treatment was the first 10 pages of the film. Page two of the treatment was the next 10 pages of the film. And just checking those off, crossing them out with a red marker every that was just awesome. I was like, okay, I got, I got 18 more beats to go. I got 17 more, 16 more. And then, um, so it was more logical. Uh, the story was already set in my mind. It wasn't like I was writing to explore something. It was just finishing it. That was exciting for me. Once you were finished, did you start sending it out to producers? How did all that work? Um, I knew I was just going to make it. So I sent it out to producers who were, I always say students of film rather than film students. Um, I think there's this difference. I think we're all students of film. Um, but I, I set out for, uh, I sent it to a couple very independent producers, 
who really know and I think they're trying to get their start too. I said, are you interested in making a feature film? Because if you are, I have one. It's going to take a lot of work, but I have one that you can get under your belt. Because I knew where I was at. This is a first feature for me. I knew I wasn't going to you know, get a major, major player in the game yet. Um, and I wanted to find someone who was at my level so that they could have something on their belt too. Um, and a lot of them said, I'm totally interested. And then I never heard back from them. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and till I decided, fine, I'm going to produce it. And um, I started doing all the things that a producer would do. You know, I started um, finding locations and finding other team members to build it and uh, started hunting for a whole team and found a team who then connected us to the producer of the film. And um, she is my rock. She will be my producer forever. She's amazing. Her name's Kristen Dorena. Oh, she's oh, nice. just great at what she does. Yeah. And how important was that that you two clicked? Because it sounds like you guys are, mm -hmm. you have almost a friendship and a, yeah. It, yeah. it sounds like it's very, very important. <sighs> Super important, I think. Um, Again, one side of my logical brain says it's just business, so it doesn't you don't have to click with a person, but just get the business done. But it's so much more fun and works way better when you do click. When you're friends and you're going to work with people you love, and and you're saying, yeah, let's let's throw ideas back and forth. M most importantly, you have to be that friend too. You know, being the director or whatever, you have to be that person that you expect them to be. You have to treat them the way they want you, you want them to treat you. You know. You have to be open for their ideas and and say yes and say no and, and debate and figure things out. But yeah, absolutely super important to be friends with them. I, I think it's more fun that way. You know, it's way more fun. Also, too, there's going to be things that'll go wrong in production and it'll be you'll be there like, you know, having people you depend 11 on. 11 hours, you know, and yeah. Yeah, just stressed out and then totally. to, to have it be smooth. I would call her and say, I need, a, I need to emotionally vent. You know, <laughs> that's what it was becoming. Can I have so, her number? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> she, she would love it. Okay. Um, but it got to that point where I was like, I'm just going to give you all my baggage and the, the, the production baggage and the emotional baggage and, and everything. And she graciously took it and just manned it and hand it, handled business. And she did such a great job because it got to the point where I was struggling. I had two producers on the film, actually. And uh, the other one was named Maggie. And again, going to her and saying, um, I need you to get this done now. And she would just do it. They were very, very good at that. And because I respected them and loved them as people, it, it made it so much easier. Yeah. That's awesome. But if you don't, if you don't have someone you totally agree with, just remember that it is a business and you can work with people you don't like to achieve a goal. Um, as long as you all can keep your egos in check, you may not like each other, fine. But remember, you're going to work to tell a story, to make a movie, and that's more important than anything else. Well, a scenario that was brought up in a comment over the weekend was great. And forgive me, I don't have their YouTube um, name here, but I can put a screenshot in the video. And they just brought up the fact that be aware that sometimes if the director has not enough of their own sort of camp, not enough of their own friends or allies on set, mm. that the production could be kind of almost like steered away from them. And mm. I thought that was a really wow. interesting point. I've never experienced that. I've never yeah. directed yeah. A, a film like that. Um, but I, I was just wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, on that. I, I've yet to be on a big, big major production um, where there's lots and lots of hands involved. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I can speak to that yet because I just know from the experience I've had, I, I'm sure that does happen for sure. Uh, I, I hope it happens less. I hope people are more collaborative than, they, than they're not. I hope people are like, yeah, let's all work together to make this happen. And that's the dream, obviously. Um, but I'm sure that does happen. And, and I wouldn't, I don't know, I've not been in that experience yet. So I don't know how to speak to it, you know, how to give advice appropriately how to handle a situation like that. Cause oh, yeah, I, I guess he was just saying that, you know, just make sure that you have some of your own people. It's almost like a CEO being ousted from their company oh, because too I many see. board members yeah, or shareholders, true. whatever say, you know mm. what, let's get rid of them and they have their own idea. And right. so, and wow. that has happened yeah. um, uh, where people have these agendas. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. take it, boil it down to an indie film set and you're trying to make your day. Yeah. You're, you're, you want to get people to lunch or dinner, whatever, and it, there's stress. And then 
you have these other agendas around. And I, yeah. I was really intrigued by that. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll say this. Be so, like I read this quote the other day. I forget who said it, but be so good they can't get rid of you. I forget oh, okay. who said it, but okay. yeah, <laughs> be so good they can't, you know? Um, and and be, so, be so fun and happy that they don't want to. That is true. That is true. You know? I, but I don't know. I, that would, that's a scary situation. I would, I don't even like thinking about it because it just seems so not fun. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think, well, I, I, again, life I isn't always like I, I, happy again, and again, upbeat, I don't want to say I, that I, it yeah. doesn't happen. I, I just hope that it doesn't, you know? Sure, sure. And, and I agree with what you're saying. And I think that's great when you're with people that you've met, that you mesh with, yeah. and that you yeah. know, okay, they trust you, you trust them. And yeah. it's, Maybe I'll say this, as a young filmmaker, establish your tribe early. Ooh, okay. Establish your tribe early. Like these, like the people I worked with on this film, they will always be the first to have the option to shoot this or not. You know, if they're busy on another project, we'll find someone else. But they'll always get it first because they're amazing people, and I know the system. And I truly think that financiers don't want to lose money, right? And so if they can hire a team that does mesh, all the better. You know, because they want to avoid those pitfalls. They want to avoid losing money on a project because the crew wasn't getting along. So if establish your tribe early. Say, I have a producer, I have a writer, I have actors, I have, I have, this, I have these people. If you want to look at others, fine, you know, we, we can talk. But just know that you'll get a great quality project from this team. So work now to establish your tribe so that you don't get ousted later. And if, and if you're a director for hire, or whatever, and, and they bring you aboard, um, you know, earn your stripes, earn your place, and say, you know, this be, be so, be such a great person, they don't want to get rid of you. Sure. You know, because that's, that's scary. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was not so much getting rid of, it was um, taking a group, sort of by consensus, taking the production over and steering it in a certain way because right. there were too many people in the same camp that had the same agenda. I think yeah, that's what his yeah. comment was. And I was yeah. like, wow, that is really interesting. I mean, you hear about famous CEOs that right. the same thing happened right, right. to. And, yeah, yeah, and honestly, the only thing I could, I can put myself in that position in, in my imagination. And at that point, I would, I would look at my, myself. If, if the, the masses are saying, we're gonna, we're gonna take control, then there might be something that I'm, doing I would look at my I would look at myself and say maybe I, maybe I need to look at this differently um, yeah so David just brought up something great behind the camera that be careful who your DP is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's really where they can also steer away yeah I can totally see that I, I was looking I I, uh, I had two I was looking at for this film um, the one I eventually hired and then this older gentleman um, he, he had a lot of experience, been around for a long time, but in my gut, because I, I told him, hey, we're going to be working with a lot of young people, and um, he goes, I have a lot of ideas, and I go, that's great, I, I welcome the ideas, and he goes, I don't know if I would like to work with an assistant DP because um, I just don't know if, you know, he may have an idea that I don't agree with and vice versa, and it seemed like he had experiences where his ideas were not welcomed or something, um, and I just knew in that moment that he was not going to be easy to work with because he had already simply told me in the interview process that he wasn't sure about welcoming other ideas, you know? And I knew that I didn't want to deal with that, you know? And I don't know if it was a generational thing, you know, he was, I don't mind working with people who are experienced for sure. But he was very sure that he was going to have his ideas and if they weren't agreed with, that was fine. But his ideas, you know, he trusted. And uh, I'm way more collaborative than that, you know? So I went with a, a DP who was just out of USC, young guy, amazing eye, loved him. He was great. His name's Isaac Park, and he's just an awesome dude. Okay. And gave so much, it always come to me, what do you want this to feel like? And that's my language. Okay, well, I want it to feel like this. He said, all right, I got it. I did not even look at the dailies. I trusted his eye that much. I just said, I trust you because we had that relationship, you know? And I, I wouldn't have gotten that from the other guy, for sure. <laughs> I think I saw that he was the co-director, like, so you had two directing credits? Uh, you no. were a director, no? Okay. Well, okay, so I, I directed under a pseudonym. Oh, yeah, okay. Because uh, <laughs> it's out now. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, because I, I, didn't want, I didn't want the focus to be the directing. I wanted my, I did this so that I could be an actor and a writer. 
And I felt it'd be safer to direct under a pseudonym because uh, they would take less attention off the focus. They take less focus off on the directing and put more focus on the acting, which is what I really want to do and write. Um, I will do. I will direct. I love it. Uh, but it's not. It wasn't my focus. So that's why I direct, direct, directed under a pseudonym. Yeah, I'm not even credited as the director. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, it's like the Kaiser Sose. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then with Isaac, so I'm sure he's definitely directing when you're in a scene because that would be difficult. He 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 didn't. Um, he would call action. Um, a, Kate, we'd split up on who called cut. Um, he would direct. He would direct the frame, the framing for sure. I need you guys to stay in frame this way, or this is the framing you have, or this is your this is what you've got. But as far as like the character work and, and directing the story, he, he left that all up to me. Wow, you know, he very was cool. really gracious like that. He just wanted to make the film look beautiful, and that's I cared about that. I was like, I'll tell the good story, you make it look pretty, and uh, because I can write literary metaphor all day, but translating literary metaphor into visuals not necessarily my forte. <laughs> so I needed someone I could trust who could see my ideas and make that a visual actuality. And he was great with that. How did you set the budget for the film? Great. A <laughs> um, little, little nervous to talk about this because oh. I will, but it's, it's because I want people to take it seriously and I don't want them to look at it, look at the money um, because we didn't have a lot. Um, and I want them to say, you know what, who cares that it was shot for this? It's a good story. We had $4,000 production budget, period. period. That's all we had was $4,000. And t cliche, I called all my aunts and my uncles, my dad, my family, friends of the family and said, hey, I can shoot this for $1,000. I need 200 bucks from each of you. And they all chipped in. They were all really excited because they know. And I ended up with $4,000 and I told everyone, this is what we have to make this film. So let's do it. And I will say very upfront, it was so much easier to do than people think. Yeah. And why do you think that you were able to get it under the wire like that, like you know, under the four thousand dollar mark? It's a feature, right? Feature. Mm -hmm. um, everyone, first and foremost, um, everyone did it because for the credit. They, they everyone I, I hired them on this said, "Listen, this is what I got. We can make it look really good. We can get locations. We can get. I'll feed you guys every day." But unfortunately, right now, um, we're going to have to the, the eyeballs that people put on this film, the, the, the credit of having a feature under your belt. That's our payment. That's everyone's payment right now. That's my payment. I'm not ashamed to say that as, as a new young indie filmmaker. I'm not ashamed to say that because we all start there. We all have, you know, um, I, I had what I had and that's what we could do, go with. Um, and and so they were all just so gung ho about it. They were all said, you know what? The story is worth it. It's a great enough story to make it happen. So yeah, they were willing to put all their effort, their time, their life. They gave me 23 days of their life straight. Wow. Yeah, 23 days straight, no breaks. And we shot the whole thing in that time um, for that amount of money. And it's so doable. Um, but it, again, going back to having a great solid team, yeah. It worked. Uh, there, there was a, one occasion where I had to kind of, as the director say, I had to pull someone aside and say, listen, this, this behavior is, it didn't work. It's not working. Let's correct it. And they graciously took it and said, you're right. I'm sorry. I was stressed because of the time limit and the time crunch. And it's never, and I go, there's always going to be time limits. There's always going to be stresses. There's always going to be money issues. There's always going to be that. Get used to that now <laughs> in a place you can and, and take that with you. And this person graciously accepted the advice and we just progressed on. Um, but, but yeah, it ha I literally asking every family member I had <laughs> if nice. they could help fund it and they did and we made it work. That's awesome. They yeah. believe in you and totally. they want to see you happy and do well. Always have. Yeah. That's very cool. Wow. Yeah. And I don't think, I wanted to say this, I don't think that that should be out of the norm. You know, I want, I want great experiences like this to be the norm. I, I, I feel like there's this general feeling about bleeding for the art and, you know, Van Gogh cutting off your ear to, to make great art. It's like, I never, I want to make movies. It's so much fun, right? I want to make them with great people. And, and I understand that there's lots of stresses. And I think, you know, I think that's what kind of leads to, to a lot of the problems is that person, people not being able to handle their own stresses. Um, but if, if you can set your ego aside and just have a great time making movies with people, then that holds, that's the reason we, we were able to do it with $4,000 because 
everyone involved was just excited and happy to do it. Now that doesn't take into account post, right? No, okay, no. Okay, so that was just so production. Post production, we had zero zero dollars because I had four thousand. Period. So again, I, I reached out to a lot of young people who were trying to develop credits for themselves: sound engineers, sound mixers, composers. Um, and I said, hey, you want to be credited on a feature? This is what I can offer later. This is what we're doing. And they, all of them. Again, number one rule, ask first, right? And I just asked, said, hey, would you want to be a part of this? Every one of them said yes. Every one of them. I would get responses like crazy. I was never trying to take advantage of anybody. Um, but I knew I had a feature. And that, that magical word is amazing, right? And um, uh, you know, in the post, I would let people, like our editor, for example, I said, hey, he, he, my editor was doing a lot of industrials. And he was really looking to get into to narrative work. And I said, I have a feature. And he said, okay, let's do it. And he gave so much, just six months of his time to edit the whole thing. Oh, wow. I, I mean, and turnaround was amazing. Taking notes so graciously. Um, I would always ask, what do you think? You know, being collaborative. And it was just an amazing experience. My editor is Matt Ron, amazing guy, amazing guy. Um, and then, yeah, with like the composers, I, I had one composer who felt really overburdened by all the music we had. It's all Latin themed music, very, very high energetic. And I said, hey, would you mind if I got a bunch of other guys to work? And they said, yeah. So I would reached out to a bunch of composers and said, hey, can you do a cut two songs? All yes, totally, 100%. Yes. I said, this is the deal. We don't have this or that. And they said, totally fine. I can, I can manage two songs. And uh, they, all, they all just jumped on board and it was just amazing, amazing. Um, you know, some, some of the songs I had to cut, some of the songs I used, whatever, but um, it was really an exciting experience to just <laughs> bring a bunch of people in because they wanted to be a part of a feature, you know? Do you think if it had been a short, it would have been different? Just because with the yeah. feature? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, feature, features, is, it's such a calling card. It's a huge calling card when you are credited to a feature. Um, I keep saying that word, but I, I can't stress it enough. It's a, yeah. it's a big word in this industry. It is, and yeah. When you have a feature to do or being done or working, working on, people want to be a part of that, especially if it's the first time for them. Um, and, and they've been in the industry for some time and they just haven't had their break yet. And, and they've been doing industrials or they've been doing music videos or commercials for a long time. Like they're ready to take, tackle something bigger. They, they are just ask you never know who you're going to meet you never know who you're going to be a part of and 90 percent of the time they'll reach out and say yeah i'm totally willing to help you know and i am so grateful for them they 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 know it i've told them hundreds and hundreds of times how grateful i am for them because they made the film they made it you know i had the idea i orchestrated it but without them it wouldn't be a film and did you screen it for all of them oh yeah and yeah. how was that uh it was exciting to first and foremost it was exciting to have the crew and cast see it because um, they, it was their sweat and blood that went into it. Um, but then having random people there also, friends, families, you know, who could then validate their work, validate what we had done and say, yeah, it was great or it was good or I love it. It was watchable, which is what I wanted more than anything. Just to have a watchable film, someone, something people could watch on a Friday night, you know, and to see their reactions like, oh my gosh, like it happened. It, 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 it like, I think a lot of people in LA, they, they talk a lot more than they act. And I have met a lot of them and oh, we're going to get a feature done, this and that. And the fact that it got done and they saw that it got done, they were like, whoa, this like happened. And then to have people watch it was crazy for them, I think. It was amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. How do you find these young, eager creatives that will work on a feature film? Okay. Um, so I went to a site called Mandy.com. I went to Craigslist and I posted an ad with very transparent instructions. This is what we're doing. This is what I have. This is what I can offer you. Very transparent, as honest as possible. And the people who are okay with that, emailed. And if they weren't okay with that, then they didn't email, right? Um, I got a ton of emails, so many, that hours after I posted. I'd love to be a part of it. I'd love to read the feature. I'd love to, to help with the music. I'd love to do this or that. Um, and Mandy.com was a great resource. Uh, Craigslist was a great resource. Uh, of course, I vetted a lot of them for sure. Sure. Um, but I, I found that when I, and again, when I said students of film, then everyone came in. I, I wanted people, because I mean, my DP was two or three years out of USC, you know, and really was ready for something big. Um, so they all just were willing to, to work. And it, it was using those resources, reaching out on that site and being as transparent as possible. 
right? That's the key because they all knew what they were getting into. There was no secrets. There was no like, oh, we're out of money or we have more money than they know. They knew, they, they knew there was 4,000 bucks. They knew what they were getting into and that was that. And they will, if you build it, they will come, right? They, they will reach out to you if they're interested. And if they're not, they won't. Don't worry about them. Describe to me transparent, like how, how is, because I've seen some stuff on Craigslist. It's like mm -hmm. blunt, all caps, okay. seven explanation points. Right. And you're like, whoa, right. Right. okay, maybe two. two. <laughs> it, it, letting people know what they're getting in for. So I have a feature film. We are shooting it for 20 days straight. No breaks. We have $4,000. That $4,000 is going to locations. It's going to equipment and it's going to feeding you. Um, we're shooting all over LA. Um, and this is how we're, this is how we're going to shoot it. It's an indie drama. Um, and this is what you can expect, right? Um, this is who I am as a person. And when you're that transparent with the facts, you know, you're not saying, well, we have some investors looking, you know, we, we have potentially $20,000 coming. No, don't be ashamed that you have no money. Don't be ashamed of that. All right. Just let them know straight up. This is how it is. You don't have to break it down their door with it. It doesn't have to be all caps. Don't oversell it. Don't be super excited where you're, oh my gosh, we're doing it. You know, just be, be calm, be relaxed, right. have fun. We're making a feature film. Let's have some fun. And, and it's going to be a lot of hard work. Uh, but if you're in for that, then, then you're welcome. And I got so many, like I said, I got so many interviews and I just picked the ones I wanted. So it sounds like you were open and fair and honest yes. instead yes. of like trying to pull the wool over someone eye, yes. someone's eyes or like being so like blunt and mean about it that people like scares people away. I was never trying to be more than I was. I think a lot of people I, I've met are like, oh, I've got this in the pipeline. Or I've got that in the pipeline. I'm doing this or <laughs> I'm working. I look them up two seconds later and they're, they're no, well, you know, I was a child actor and I'm working on this now. And then it's like, they have like maybe half of credit or whatever. I was, I was very blunt. I'm a, I'm a, this is a first time feature from a person who has never directed a film before. If you're interested, welcome. Right. Yeah. So just great. be open like that. I like that. Isn't it kind of crazy though that you had a short or a couple shorts that you've done and then here you've taken this big leap where you're writing, directing or co-directing, mm -hmm. producing um, and then you're the protagonist right. in a feature. Like how, how does that happen? That, that's, that's um, bold. That sounds yeah, scary. Yeah, it was, it, again, I, I shot the film when I was 30. Right. So it took a long time to get to that point. It wasn't overnight. <laughs> you know, I had been, I had done a lot of short films my whole life growing up with my friends and family in college, done a lot of training as an actor, uh, really learned how to write well, took a year and a half studying videos from great YouTube channels um, on how to tell a good story through film, um, how to direct, how to direct a film, how to light, how to learning what cameras are and, and, and you know, F stops and all this stuff. I, it took a year and a half to learn all that because um, I didn't go to film school, right? That YouTube was my film school. You guys were part of my film school, right? So um, it, 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 it wasn't crazy because it was the right time. It was, it was, I was ready for it. Um, it would have been crazy having to try this when I was 22. That would have been crazy. But um, it was just, I was just ready for it. You know, I, I was done with shorts. I was done with five, five minute shorts. I was done with 15 minute shorts. I was just ready to make a big one. And, um, and it, like I said, it was just all fell into place. It really did. Um, it was, I wasn't scared. I wasn't nervous. I was excited. Um, uh, you know, looking back in hindsight, you know, having finished the feature and writing the words, the end, that was an amazing experience, amazing feeling, but um, be just, just, you don't run before you can walk and take the time to prepare yourself and practice. You know, I, I was very strict growing up when I was writing my shorts and doing my shorts, I was writing five page shorts and I was writing, I was practicing how to write a full story arc in five pages, religiously sticking to five pages, giving myself a five page budget and then advancing. Okay. Now I'm going to do 10 pages. And that was that. And I never did anything more than that, but I got really used to writing to a page budget. So when I had to write 90 pages, I got it to 90 pages, you know? Um, so like I said, it wasn't crazy because I was prepared. I, I, I watched a movie last year, documentary, uh, Free Solo. And in an interview with Alex Honlon, he, he said, they were asking, how much adrenaline are you feeling up there? And he goes, well, I, I wasn't feeling any adrenaline. 
Adrenaline is when things go wrong. I was calm, I was collected, I was ready for this, this experience. And I, I totally agree with that. I, had I felt nervous or unprepared, then I think it would have been crazy. But I was ready, I was ready for it. So you finish the film, you finish editing, and then now you have this movie. What, what are you doing with it? Okay, so it, it, it's never as easy as, it's not as easy as I thought it was gonna be as far as, okay, the editing's done, it's done. Because we shot on a professional cinema camera, right? So there's a lot that goes into editing raw footage, right? So then it's like, okay, time to color the film. Gonna learn how to color a film. So I did. Um, mm. Need to learn how to uh, compose music. I can't do that, so I gotta find people who can. So it, it, it took a long time to, it took about a year, a year to finish the film. Um, at that point, when it's all completed, uh, we, we talk to my producer and we say, how are we gonna distribute this thing? How are we gonna get people's eyeballs on it, right? Um, obviously, the most popular route is the film festival route, which I was never interested in, actually. Um, I, I talked to all my, my team before and I said, hey, we're just probably gonna go VOD. So just leave it at that. I'm not really interested in festivals. They said, that's fine. Um, but then I decided that festivals offer eyeballs, people to see. So we submitted to lots of festivals uh, and we are continuing to submit to lots of festivals now that it's fully completed um, and still having to get to hear back from things. Um, we recently got into the new filmmakers festival here in oh, LA. Great. Um, that's very it's exciting. So we, we, they, every month they premiere a feature and then a bunch of shorts and we are the feature for next month, Yay. which is super exciting. Oh, cool. uh, so yeah, June 29th and we're really excited about that. Nice. Um, which, where is it located? Down, downtown LA, I think it's called the South Park Center okay. in downtown LA. Um, and uh, they, host film, they host film festival every month. It's so cool because we don't have to wait a year, right, yeah. for something cool. Um, it's all new, new budding filmmakers, um, people who are just getting their start in the industry. It's awesome. Um, so it's a really good resource, look, really good film festival to look into for young, young new filmmakers. Right. Um, uh, but again, submitting to all the big festivals, I never was hoping for distribution through those festivals. I was just hoping for people to see the film, um, but mostly VOD. Um, Amazon Prime is amazing because Amazon Video Direct um, as long as you have the right technical specs for your camera, for, for, for your film, uh, the right closed captions, and um, two pieces of art, you can upload through Video Direct, and then you can have your video on Amazon Prime tomorrow. And then it's all about, you know, the promotions, <laughs> which is crazy. So um, after, after we see how these festivals kind of run, um, if we get into them or not, then we'll just go straight back to Amazon Prime. And um, we're in the talks currently with, um, one of the PR individual, an individual with PR uh, for Netflix, and she's kind of helping us develop our press packets and everything for that, so we can wow. develop buzz around it. And then we're gonna set up, you know, press screenings and try to just get as many eyeballs on the film as possible. But it is definitely self-distributing for sure. <laughs> Do you know what the specs are for a video direct? Yeah. So um, closed captions are absolute must. Um, I would say follow Netflix's standard for, for closed captions. Netflix has a, a really specific standard. Amazon doesn't have a specific standard, but if you follow Netflix's standard, it kind of covers the across the board, everyone. Um, all the VOD sites, I think they have the best standard. Uh, you can look it up online, it's right there. Um, that's what we did. We followed their standards to a T. I mean, it's as specific as um, no less, your, your caption can't be less than 20, 20 frames. Um, you have to have a minimum of, of two frames separating each caption. Oh, wow. Um, you can't, don't separate your, your phrases at, at adjectives or things like that. I mean, it's very specific. Wow. But just follow those guidelines um, and then you'll be really good. Amazon will take them. Um, two pieces of art. Uh, you have to have your, a poster and then um, an, another poster that uh, in different sizes. They have their, I don't, I'm not familiar with the sizes right now, but they have their sizes on their site. Um, build those posters really easy, upload the two pieces of art, and then you'll have those set to go, and then upload your film. And your film, I, I don't think, I think they've gotten tighter recently. I can't speak for Amazon specifically, but um, because I knew we shot on a cinema camera with all professional sound and everything, I knew we would be okay. I, I think back in the past, they would like just allow home video kind of stuff. I don't know if they do that anymore. 
Um, but they will review it. And then within four, two to four business days, it'll be up live on Amazon Prime. And you have a film on Amazon Prime for everyone to see right now. And, and then I think that's really, really solid because then you can use that, to, you know, hey, Hulu, we're talking to, you know, we're on Amazon Prime, you can check it out right now. Netflix, we're on Amazon Prime, you can check it out right now. Most importantly, press, hey, you can check out our, our film on Amazon Prime right now. Um, and it's got some clout. Amazon's got clout and they have an Oscar. Absolutely. <laughs> they have an Oscar. Absolutely, so, yeah. so it's a really, really great place to host your film in the beginning while you're still trying to generate buzz. I know you have submitted to a few festivals, mm -hmm. but you said in the beginning you didn't really want to go that yeah. route. Uh, I, I felt like festivals had a stigma attached. I felt like it was the only thing indie filmmakers could do is go to festivals. And, and I felt like there was a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure to get your film seen at a, at a festival and to find distribution to sell it. And it was really stressful just thinking about that. I just wanted people to watch it. Right. I wasn't concerned with selling the film. I wanted people just to watch it. So I opted out of the festivals because I just thought it was going to be way too much pressure for our team. Uh, we did more research and realized that festivals are really are an avenue. It's not the avenue that I think a lot of young filmmakers think, but it is an avenue. When we looked at it like that, then it was like, oh, yeah, let's let's just submit. We might as well. You know, I know that a lot of festivals um, when you're invited, you're guaranteed in and some festivals, you're just paying for the hotel rooms. I, I get that. Um, but there's a lot of these small local festivals. You know, you, you, you may not get a big distribution deal there, but you will get people seeing it. And that's exciting. Um, and word of mouth spreads. So yeah, we didn't want to because we just, I just thought that it was way too much pressure. Having done the research, I realized that it's just a really another great avenue. So how we're submitting. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. So you change because a lot of times it seems like people want to do the festival route and then I something know. happens and they change their mind. So it sounds yeah. like you. No, I, I changed my. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't want to do it at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you think one of the caveats will be that you have to go? You want it to be where at least you can attend because you know it's a different feeling when you're right when you're crowd. there. I, I I would find a way there no matter what, no matter where it was. Um, I that wasn't a, an issue. Um, cause if it, my film was there, I was going to be there. Um, I think it was just, just the, the pressure of a lot of young people trying the, trying desperately to make a sale. And that just seemed like it was no fun. You know, I, like if you go to festivals, like I'm sure we've all been to, you're just there to watch great art, you know? And I think we need to remember that it's, I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't, I was just too, I just didn't want to worry about selling the film. Sure. Well, there's yeah. AFM, which is fantastic. Yes. But I mean, that's a whole nother. Yeah, whole different ballgame. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, the film market is like, you, 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 that's an awesome, an awesome opportunity too, you know, because everyone's sure. there to buy and sell. Everyone, and, and you go into that knowing that, right? Like, that's something I, I prepare my mind for, right? I'm going to, if I go to AFM, I'm going there with the, the, the mentality to work deals. Right, for sure. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and that's what you should do at the uh -huh. AFM. I think festivals, people, I think people will sometimes forget that festivals are film festivals and they try to treat film festivals as AFM, right? I think they forget that. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe there'll be a big producer here who will see my film and buy it. So we'll just go to AFM, right? Sure. You know, but if you're going to go to a film festival, just be happy with people watching it, you know? Did you get to do Q and A's or? We, yes, we are. We are going to be because this oh, is our okay. world premiere at this festival the, the, oh, yeah, it's, okay. our, it's our world premiere oh, so it's our okay. first one I thought, sorry i thought you already screened it no else. we screened it at it was a private premiere for my oh, friends and family oh, gotcha. crew that kind of thing we did a q a there um but this one the this one the, the new filmmakers festival la yeah. has a q a that we're very excited about i don't know what in store for that it, it's very a really relaxed q a we just chat it's really what it is i've been to the new filmmakers festival and it's awesome awesome Q and A, and they have so. a red carpet. I think. Yeah, they, they have a little yeah, red carpet. It. They have nice. a step and repeat. Yes. So you're taking pictures. Get and the outfit ready. And they, yeah, they have they go. have like a, a <laughs> party for it's just oh, super cool. awesome. Yeah, it's super awesome. It's an event. Yeah. yeah, it's an event. They really really take care of to try and make as many people come to this thing as possible. They are here for new filmmakers. It is an amazing festival, and we are so grateful to be a part of it. They have themed months, like next month is LGBTQ because it's Pride Month, and so ours is because it deals with a, a, a young gay man. It, it's being featured there, and for that, for that, um, that genre, and yeah. so yeah, I don't know what to expect as far as the Q and A. I'm very excited though. Yeah, I've heard about people even for shorts like 
driving from other states just so they can go to that red carpet because yeah. it's yeah. a huge it, it's so it makes cool. you feel like you know this it happened i know that's such a small part of it it's, but it's, it, it's, it's so it's, fun it's kind of a cool reminder of yes. like okay we did this i know that that this is not why we do it but this is sort of like the 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 cherry on top the mm -hmm. icing on the cake that mm -hmm. we get. it's exciting because after that you know um movie maker magazine interviews the filmmaker so that's really exciting oh, as well. Wow. I love that magazine. Very it's cool. Super great. That publication's awesome. Um, so yeah, it's just a whole really amazing event that they, these guys host. And so this is the world premiere. And then from there, we'll see what other festivals we can get into. Uh, I know a lot of festivals have world premiere caveats. So they want to own the world premiere status. Um, I know big ones like Hands and Sundance and, and South by Southwest, all these big ones want the world premiere. So that's okay. If we don't get into those, that's fine. Um, we, we are just excited to be at any of the festivals at this point, you know? And Pride is June? I, I, I don't want to say because okay. I don't really know. Okay. I'm assuming so because next, year, next month's festival is all LGBTQ okay. themed films. Yeah. So. so then maybe you could submit, I mean, do you, do you only want it to be seen in that genre? Or no, it sounds like it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's a film about yeah, relationships. It's a film about, it's a film about growing up in your twenties. It's, oh, okay. it's a film about learning who you are in your twenties. He doesn't, he doesn't question his sexuality. He's a gay, he's a young gay man, but so many people are, who cares, right? He's just a young gay man. Um, it's really about growing up in your twenties, which I think is, is important. I think it's just remembering that everyone's a human and everyone grows up in your twenties and everyone figures things out and messes up regardless of race or orientation. He just happens to be a young gay man who's dealing with certain things like growing up. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, any festival can take it, you know, um, I, I wasn't trying to set out writing a, a, a film that had a specific message about whatever. I just wanted to write a film about people growing up. You know, did did when you did the friends and family um, screening? I realize everybody's kind of close to everybody that's there. But what were some of the questions? Was it about orientation or was it just about life? I mean, did they have to? Take they, it there? they, I think, I think they read it well as it was just a film about life. Um, actually, surprisingly, a lot of the questions were about the music. Oh. Yeah, because it's all Latin themed music. There's a lot of mambo and salsa and conga drums and. And they were like, well, where did you come up with that idea? And it was like, I, I just knew that he needed a, 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 a rhythmic sound that pulled him towards something and Latin music was perfect for that. Cool. Um, but yeah, no, nothing, nothing specifically about race or anything like, or, or orientation or anything like that. They just knew that it was just a story about a young person growing up. He happens to be gay, right. you know? Is there anything you wish you'd had someone tell you before you made a, the feature? Was there something here and there where if someone could just have warned you? Everything I wished I would have known, I, I, I learned. I learned from channels like yours and other YouTube channels um, where I learned how to, I mean, I'm, YouTube was my film school, no joke. Um, in fact, there's so, I mean, there's so many channels in thank you in my credits. Oh, you okay. guys are in the thank you oh, in my, my gosh, credits. Oh my gosh, really? You guys oh. taught me so much, right? Thank you. So, wow. so everything I wished I had learned, I, I made sure to learn, right? Um, any of the pitfalls or the warnings, I got all that in, in my studies. <laughs> I, I, okay, what can <laughs> I look right out for? Not. What can I, so I learned from everyone's mistakes and, and I think that's why it was such an enjoyable, easy, smooth experience for us. Um, <clears throat> If I, if I really think hard about something I wish I could have learned, um, I, th I think the one thing I will say is I wish I, there was more focus on B-roll, for sure. It's such a weird detail, but I wish I had learned to shoot B-roll and plan for B-roll and inserts and stuff well before him. Because when we got to our post editing, I had nothing, I had no B-roll. I had to reshoot a bunch of stuff and it just, none of it makes sense, right? Inserts, come on, right? Um, so that that's one, interesting detail I wish I had really learned about beforehand was planning for B-roll um, because we didn't and we didn't and we didn't have any and we had to reshoot a ton of stuff and it was tough um, but as far as like the experience of filmmaking no I, I, I heard the lessons and I took them <laughs> from all the channels I watched and whatnot mm -hmm. so yeah there was nothing I looked back and was like oh man I wish I didn't do this no I, I just followed the guidelines that people taught taught yeah what about set photography did you have a lot? I of wish we had. I wish we did. Um, you had a few though we, yeah, on we, your Facebook. Yes, uh, we had the producers taking candid shots. Um, I didn't instruct them to. Thank God they did. <laughs> um, but having a set photography is 
super necessary because uh, they're one, they're capturing the moment, they're capturing the excitement, the memories, but it's so great for publicity. So great. Behind the scenes is so much fun to, to study and look and research and, and learn about. Um, so our producers did take some, uh, but uh, it's not something I wish we would have had an on set photographer all the time, but couldn't get one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I wasn't worried about spoilers either because we're, we're, we're not known. So spoil the crap out of it, right? <laughs> get people to know what this is. Oh, there's a new film. What's this mean? What's that mean? Great. Talk about it. I mean, we're not like, we're not like a major, major blockbuster who needs to keep everything tight lipped. No, I, I want to find out. Yeah. Take pictures, leak, whatever you can. I want people to find out about this thing, you know? So. It's not, I remember when La La Land, I think, was right. Like leaked. Right. They, oh, right. Right. <laughs> you know, there was like well, some pictures far away. Of and now dancing. you're finding, <laughs> now you're finding directors like, well, if we're going to have paparazzi leak it, I might as well leak it myself. Sure. So at least let's get the pictures to look good. Right. Let's get the videos to look good. And uh, yeah, it's like, it's like part of the game now, I think, you know, leaking your stuff to, to hype it up. But yeah, I ha had people leaked my stuff. I would have felt honored, <laughs> you know, because no one knows about it yet. So. So when do you think it'll be out? I know you said mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. up on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Is it for per, used for purchase? Right well, now? it's it's currently not on Amazon Prime at this moment anymore because the film um, the the film festival wants the world wants the world release. So we oh. it was literally on for eight hours. We got the email saying we were in. We took it right down. <laughs> eight hours. So it wasn't like well we didn't really break any rules because like no one saw it really. It was like eight hours live. Um, so it will be live on Amazon Prime July 1st. July 1st, Which okay. is like two days after the festival. Gotcha. Um, and then, yeah, it'll be live there. Anyone can watch it, you know? Uh, but for now, we need to give the priority to the festival. Understandable, you know? Everyone has their, their regulations and their statuses that they need to hit, so yeah. So you're gonna try to find distribution, Netflix, whatever, and if for whatever reason that doesn't happen, are you gonna do an aggregator where you're gonna then put it on video? I, I, I thought things? about going through Distribber. Um, I, I, uh, they're obviously the go-to. I know Distribber works directly with Netflix oh, for, great. for stuff. I mean, Netflix goes to Distribber to aggregate everything awesome. first. Like even if you don't go through Distribber to get to them, Netflix goes to Distribber, right? So they're a great company for self-distribution, amazing. Um, I unfortunately did not have the funds. I had $4,000, I don't have the funds for them, unfortunately. Um, but they're they're amazing. So knowing knowing the small connections I have, that's kind of the route we're going. Um, so like again, Amazon Prime, anyone can get on. We're we will be on a January July first, um, and uh, and then from there it's about pr promoting it, uh, getting, a, getting a budget for promotions, um, and then the connections we have. Um, I still have to do a lot more research on any other aggregation, uh, any other services like that, um, because I totally think they're just super helpful and amazing for indie filmmakers. Um, they have doors that sometimes we can't get into and they're already in uh, and they know how to vet your film. They know how to make sure everything's tight and, and up to standard, right? I have to learn that without them because I don't have the money for it. So um, I would love to, I would love to go through them, but or other, other distri distribution and aggregation stuff. But at this point, we're just doing it ourselves. Did you learn any lessons about directing actors that would be helpful for other first-time directors? Yeah, uh, fortunately, being an actor first, I knew how I liked being directed. Um, so I was able to translate that to my actors. Um, um, number one is story is first for anyone. Actors, directors, producers, story is first. That's the most important thing. Um, and when, when you are directing actors, um, actors are smart people. We're, we're emotionally smart, right? Yeah. So speak to them in a way that is prodding ideas or inviting ideas versus telling them exactly what to do, how to say a line. You don't want to give anyone a line reading because you're the director. You're, you're not the actor. You want to say, you know, stuff like, okay, so, so this is what the character is feeling at this moment because... Um, because of this moment earlier, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What do you think he's feeling in your in your perspective? And then you start to talk back and forth. You throw ideas, you spitball, um, and then you kind of come to a consensus. If you see a take, for example, in my film, we had a, a moment um, where our main act, one of our actors, uh, he, his name is Michael King. He plays the character Ted. He, it's it's the climax of the film. There's a very emotional moment. Um, my character's crying. 
and he's trying to console the character. He starts crying and it's a lot of emotions and crying tears. And I look at him, I say, hey, hey, your character wouldn't be crying right now. All right, your character has, has completed his arc. He's strong. He's, 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 he's um, no longer this uh, individual who, who's going to be, he'll be vulnerable with him, but you're his rock. Right? And, that, and I gave him that kind of direction. It was more metaphorical. And he said, got it. And then he was able to change his delivery. Right? I didn't tell him how to deliver it. Right. I told him what the emotions behind the delivery were, and he interpreted that. So I think, in, in, to make a longer story short, is really think about the, the, the emotions. Speak to an actor emotionally, metaphors. Get them to understand your, your, the feelings of the character, and then let them interpret that and make that physical, right? If that makes sense. Yeah, because you talked about the like a high emotional IQ. Yes, yeah. High, yeah, yeah in an intellect, but all emotional intellect mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so being sensitive to that, and also knowing that they're going to be able to take it, and and mm -hmm. you don't have to kind of like spell it. Yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Don't you don't have to spell it out. You know, say the line this way because of this. You know, just say this is what the character is going through. This is at this moment. If you have to be a logical director and say, all right, we're at. We're at the midpoint of the film. This is the biggest revelation. This is an explosion. This is something big happening. All right, your characters come this far. In this moment, we need to exemplify those feelings, right? If I need you to go bigger, I'll say go bigger. If I need you to go smaller, go smaller, whatever. But uh, trust that your actors can, can speak emotional languages and, and that they will then translate that into a physical action or being or presence. Um, but but be, be concise, be clear. Uh, uh, and just be be confident, you know. Be con know that know that you're the director, and that they're looking to you for for advice. Give them notes. Give them notes. The actors love getting notes, and if you don't have any, that's fine too. But just make sure that the notes are are. I love getting you know they're emotionally based. Feel this because of this, or or, or what do you think happens here? You know, I think this happens to you because of this. And then just let them translate that. What if you have to have a conversation that it's not a negative, but it's more, it's not something that you want to do in front of the whole casting yeah. group? Yeah, oh, that's good, that's good. Um, so if it's, if it's a more sensitive issue, um, you can simply pull the actor aside um, because you're the director. And say, all right, let's discuss this. We have this here. Um, I need to clarify some things or I need you to, to clarify something or what, what's on your mind? Why aren't you getting to this beat? Why aren't you hitting this, this emotional moment? What, what's, what's going on in your mind? And work, work through it. You almost have to be a psychologist in a way. You really do. Because sometimes you have, to, you have to help them understand and discover the characters. Because as a director, you should know them as well as them, right? Um, and the story. And so as long as you pull them aside gently, say, hey, what's going on? What, what are you feeling? Or is there something blocking you? Um, if so, what is it? How can I help you break that? Do I need to give you something different? Can, can we motivate you a different way? Um, and, and you'll start talking those things out and then go into the scene with the people and work through it. Um, I always did that. I never, never gave a note in public. I always gave, I pulled them aside really quick. T could be the, t the smallest note in the world. Hey, try it this way. Do this, do that. And then they would go back into it because I didn't want to expose anybody's process. You know, I want to be gentle about it, so I always pulled them aside and said, hey, let's, let's work this. So that's how I did it. And it works for me as an actor that way. So any director who directs me knows that. Pull me aside, give me a couple thoughts, I'll throw my thoughts, we'll work. 